Um, so it's great to see everybody here. Thanks for coming. Um, I'm a veterinarian with the Old Wildlife Care Network, which is um, a partnership between Oscar and the University of California Davis Veterinary School. And um, I probably I don't have a lot of street cred actually in this crowd because I've only been in the job for about three years. I started the job in um, May of 2010, which probably most of you recognize as pretty much the middle of the water horizon. Um, so I spent a few weeks down in Louisiana uh, working in the water horizon spill that I was brand new. And luckily in California, not on something quick. Um, we haven't had any big spills since then. Um, so I, I know a lot of stuff theoretically, but um, I don't have a lot of hands-on experience with spill response. Um, and it's funny, coming to Eros, when I first took the Eros class, you know, as a veterinarian, very animal focused, very focused on the wildlife, and as you all know, the media is very focused on the birds and the animals that are affected in the wildlife, the sea otters and Valdez. And so to me, an honest full response was, you go out, you collect the animals, and you wash them. And coming to Eros was a great eye-opening experience when I realized, wow, oil wildlife response is huge. And oil spill response is huge, and the oil wildlife response is really a very small part of that. So that was very eye-opening to me, because to me, it's, it was everything. But it is very much often the public face of an oil spill response, because that's what people see. They see the birds and the otters, and um, that's what um, strikes them emotionally. That's what upsets them, and that's what they want to see cared for. So um, although we have a very small part um, of the oil spill response, it's a very visible part. And Holly, I think, already talked to you about how we fit into ICS, to the um, command structure, during this spill. Um, but we do tend to operate somewhat as our own little Unit, our own little island within ICS, where we operate fairly independently of everything else. Um, because once we get those birds in house, then um, we're, we're doing something completely separate from what everyone else is doing. All right. So, what I'll talk about first, since we've already had a bit of a, an overview of, of what we are from Holly, I'll talk about the effects of oil on wildlife, um, both the direct effects of oil, so what the oil does to the animals, and then what the the effect of the animals being in captivity and being cared for um, by us does to them. And then I'll talk a little bit more about the WCN and, and how we work and talk about the steps in a uh, well wildlife response. So as you all know, petroleum is not a single compound. It's a mixture of many, many different compounds. Every deposit is unique, which is good in some ways because it allows us to fingerprint oil and tell us what oil comes from where. So uh, if you're not a skill that Nicole's, um, Nicole was referring to it in, in Louisiana, you, and you can't tell if that's deep water oil, that's not deep water oil. We can chemically fingerprint oil and tell you where it comes from. Oil, oil or petroleum products can be anything from black, brown, to colorless. And uh, most of them have an odor, but they may have a very strong odor or, or not such a strong odor. They may have sulfur in them or not. <coughs> and lots of oil deposits have heavy metals in them, like lead or mercury, which are highly toxic in and of themselves, in addition to the toxicity of the oil. So we think about the effects of oil in two different ways. On the one hand, all types of petroleum are going to affect feathers and fur. And that's not just because it's petroleum, that's anything. Any oily substance is going to do that. So um, mineral oil could do that, vegetable oil, fish oil. Um, some of you may have heard about the fish oiling incident that we had. Um, in the Arcata area in Crescent City last year, there were a lot of juvenile pelicans getting fouled with fish oil from um, begging for fish from fish, fishermen and, and um, dumpster diving in areas where fish offal was, um, was available to them. And those birds were um, as severely affected as they might have been from petroleum oil because they said they couldn't fly, their feathers were damaged, and they were becoming very cold. So we think of that as the external effects of oil. But then petroleum oils, in addition to that, also have organ toxicity that can range from very rapid respiratory toxicity uh, to long, long-term uh, reproductive toxicity, like they have speculated has happened in, in Valdez. And there's some evidence for that for some of the birds that actually, um, even eight or nine years out, they were still seeing lower reproductive rates in some of the birds where they, in the areas that were oiled in Valdez. So to get exposed to petroleum oil, you can inhale it, and that would cause injury to your lungs. Eventually, it would become absorbed through your lungs into your systemic circulation, but typically it's going to kill you before it 
you, you get to that point. Um, it will cause a very severe pneumonitis or pneumonia and be very painful and uncomfortable. <laughs> you could also ingest the oil, so you can eat it. Um, seems like a silly idea, but if you're a bird and you're cleaning your feathers, you know you're going to end up getting some of that oil in your mouth and swallowing it. Or if you're feeding on prey, if you're a sea otter feeding on, um, on shellfish, those animals are going to have oil within their tissues. Or if you're a bird that is feeding on fish that has oil in its tissues, you're going to ingest the oil. And that will cause ulceration of your gastrointestinal tract. So it will cause bleeding ulcers, sore um, irritation, um, cause problems with digestion. And then as we talked about before, external. So feather and fur soiling, and also just skins, skin burns. So exposed areas of birds and, or otters that are not covered with feathers can be burned, and oil can be absorbed directly into the body that way as well. But by far, by far, by far, the most, um, the biggest problems caused by petroleum products are the external problems, um, or at least they're certainly the most visible, the most obvious, and they're the ones that um, are things that we can do do something about. The inhalation injuries, oftentimes, um, the animals that inhale oil and are going to be going to die from that, it's going to happen very quickly before we can do anything about it. Um, ingestion may happen may cause problems that are more slowly um, and hard to determine and more slowly uh, causing problems. But the external oiling is what we can see and it's something we can do something about. So again, birds and mammals breathe at the surface. They, they breathe right at that oil, at that water-air interface. And so when they come up from the water to take a breath, if the oil is, if there's a slick of oil on the water, the air directly above that slick is what they're breathing and that's where a lot of the, the fumes and vapors are going to be and so they get direct lung injury from that. The light ends are the most rest, most toxic from a respiratory standpoint so these are things like jet fuel and diesel to, to some extent. Um, these are also the products that are going to evaporate very rapidly within 24 to 48 hours um, and so the animals are going to get exposed to this right away in the beginning and then it's going to dissipate, it's going to evaporate, and fewer animals will be affected by this respiratory toxicity. Many of these animals that, that inhale it initially are going to die very rapidly within hours, and so you're not going to see uh, feather effects or fur effects um, on those animals or, or gastrointestinal effects because they died before uh, they could get that sick, right? They just died of respiratory injury. Um, they can also have neurologic toxicity and have seizures. Again, that'll cause them to die very rapidly before um, before we even can catch them, really, if it's within 24 hours of the spill. So respiratory toxicity is very severe. It's typically seen just with the light ends, and there's not a lot we can do about it. Fortunately, um, that seems to be less common than what we see with the, the very big crude oil spills. Um, because that's not what is in the big tankers, right? We don't have huge, huge tankers of millions and millions and millions of gallons of, of jet fuel. The consequences of respiratory injury, again, are pain, distress, rapid death, and stranding. Again, this is a small component of what we worry about for oil wildlife because these animals typically don't live long enough for us to even see them. Ingestion, on the other hand, is something we do see and um, both birds and sea otters are going to ingest oil because they're going to take care of their fur. They're going to be preening or grooming, and they're, there's, they have no choice but to in, ingest some of the oil. They can start getting ulcerations starting from their, their mouth all the way through their entire gastrointestinal tract. Once they're, they've ingested it, they're going to absorb it systemically into their body. Um, as the oil causes ulceration throughout their mucous membranes, they're going to absorb even more of it because as that barrier is broken down, more and more of the toxic components of the oil get absorbed into the body. And so the more oil that gets absorbed into the body, the more direct toxic effects you see on things like red blood cells, which um, may, may lice, may just break apart. Um, you'll see anemia. You may see liver toxicity, kidney toxicity, and even neurologic toxicity. So systemic absorption is, uh, is a bad thing and causes direct organ toxicity. Once an animal has all these ulcerations in their gastrointestinal tract, they can't absorb nutrients. These are animals that are already now stressed to the, stressed to the max, 
desperately trying to get food into them, but they're ingesting all this oil. Now they can't absorb nutrients, so they're getting they're losing um, body condition and, and weight very rapidly because they can't absorb their food. Um, these ulcers are painful. They all ulcers will bleed, so they'll lose fluid, they'll become dehydrated and anemic, and then ultimately they'll starve. The surface effects of oil, again, this is what we deal with the most of. This is a physical disruption of the feather structure. And for any of, for most of these, you can substitute fur for feathers if you're thinking about sea otters. Um, the actual, if you look at sea otter fur and feathers under an electron microscope, they look very similar. They work in very similar ways. So what happens is when the feathers are fouled or the fur is fouled, um, the animals lose buoyancy, so they start to sink and settle lower in the water, which means more of their body is covered with is in the water, in the cold water. They can't move as well, they can't dive, they can't fly, um, and they may have burns to their eyes and to their unfeathered areas of their body, like their legs and their face. This again is an electron microscope of the feathers, and you can see all these hooks. <coughs> Here, can everyone see the hooks? That's what a feather looks like under the microscope. The hooks, um, they're called hooks and barbules and bar barb barbs, um, and they have a very intricate physical structure that causes them to interlock so that they're like a really like a really high thread count sheet. Um, you know, if you get a really expensive sheet that's 750 thread count, it's a very tight weave, similar to the weave that doctors' scrubs are made out of, but it's even tighter to the point where water cannot penetrate. So. That's what makes a bird or a sea otter waterproof, that very tight woven uh, microscopic components of the feathers to keep out the water. So because this waterproofing is a structural problem, not a structural feature, not a chemical feature, um, it's not dependent on the bird's pre-gland secretions, but it also means that if anything disrupts those hooks and barbules, they come apart and they won't come back together because there's, there's stuff in the way, there's stuff interfering with that, and the birds lose their waterproofing. Um, people do, always want to say, well, the birds are waterproof because they have a preen gland and they oil their feathers, and that's not really true. The preen gland um, is more like a hair conditioner. It keeps those feathers pliable and soft so that they can continue to interlock, but it doesn't render them waterproof. So um, birds are waterproof independent of their preen gland. And so when they're waterproof and they have this normal um, structure to their feathers, they have a layer of air around their body and the water is on the outside. And so if you pick up a duck and you put it, take it right out of the water and move its feathers back, it's dry under, under, underneath. It's not that it can handle the cold water better than other animals. It's that it's not in the cold water, essentially. It's basically entirely surrounded by feathers except for its feet, and it's not experiencing that very cold water. As soon as you disrupt the feather structure, water penetrates into the feathers, and suddenly they're in water right up to the they're right up to the skin, and that's what draws the heat away very rapidly. Here's just another picture of um, normal, happy, healthy feathers under the microscope, and you can see how um, there's very complex structure in those feathers that look um, look simple from the outside. And this is a picture of a feather that has uh, a contaminant on it. And you can see it doesn't have that nice symmetric structure. There's stuff in the way. There's stuff getting in the way of the hooks and barbules so they can have the inner lock. And when this happens, water penetrates right into the skin, and it's like you being immersed in a very cold bathtub. And just a picture of an otter, a piece of otter fur. Um, you can see clean fur with those little ridges, and then oiled fur that has material interfering with it. So again, when the birds or sea otters are oiled, they can't dive, they can't fly, they can't forage. Uh, they're preening like crazy because when a bird's feathers, when a bird gets cold, its brain says, oh, I'm cold, therefore my feathers are not properly aligned. I have to realign my feathers so that they keep the water out. So they are strongly stimulated to preen. They preen frantically. They're using a lot of energy to preen. However, they're not it's not getting them anywhere. They're ingesting the oil. Um, they're using a lot of energy, and yet they're not going to be able to remove all of that oil. So they rapidly become very cold and typically will seek to get out of the water because it's cold um, and strand on the beach if they were that long. 
And this, you don't have to worry about the details of this slide. Um, and every time someone looks at it, they find another arrow I should put in, so don't look at it too closely. But I call this the spiral of death. So all of this feeds into each other. The birds, um, they're preening more, so they're ingesting more oil. So they're absorbing more oil into their body, so they're becoming more anemic. They're getting more ulcerations in their GI tract. They're absorbing fewer nutrients, but they're using more energy because they're preening like crazy. They're getting cold, so their body um, but their metabolism is increasing to generate more heat, but um, they don't have any energy coming in because they can't forage and they can't absorb nutrients. So you can see how that can rapidly become this spiral, and within days, these animals die. And these are just some, some pictures I took off the web. Actually, I think these are from a spill in Korea of uh, just how, many, how rapidly and um, tragically these birds die. So that's the, those are the icky pictures that Jim was talking about, um, <coughs> oiled birds, but there's also a whole other suite of icky things that happen to birds when they're oiled, and, and otters as well. Um, so the birds get malnourished, they become immunosuppressed, and they can become highly susceptible to diseases such as aspergillosis, which is a fungal disease, and other infections as well. Um, Seabirds, especially like um, keels, um, like keels, like grebes, birds with very sharp keels and wounds, and murs to some extent will have keel lesions or joint swellings over their feet and legs. Yeah. I'm, I'm sorry, what's a keel on a bird? A keel is the, the breastbone. Oh, okay. So it's um, it looks exactly like a keel of a boat. Yeah. Um, and you don't really notice it in a normal bird or see it, but if you um, have a bird that's very, very thin, you'll feel it very sharply. And if that, um, if that bone is now suddenly resting on a hard surface instead of floating on water, it starts to have problems like pressure sores. Um, and then also foot problems, and I'll go into those in a minute. So the malnutrition is the fact of not only the oiling and the problems that the birds are getting because they're ingesting oil, but also because it's almost impossible to feed them enough calories in captivity to maintain their increased metabolism and just their normal metabolism. These birds have a high metabolism already, and they're typically eating a very, very high quality, high calorie food. Fish is very high in fats, um, very high in calories, and these birds are very, very good at getting the number of calories that they need. Um, feeding them in captivity, first of all, we, we can't feed them live, their normal live food, right? We're feeding them frozen thawed fish, which are already lower in calories than a, a live fish. Um, and we also feed them different kinds of um, commercial slurries, little mixes that we make. We can also grind fish up in blenders called a fish slurry. It's fantastic. Little fish milkshake. Oh my gosh, just to die for. Um, those, but if you think about it, these birds. They not only need food and calories, they need fluids, and we have to provide all that to them. And so us giving them food and fluid to maintain their body, their metabolism, and, and, and maintain their um, heat, heat uh, generation, um, it's impossible to do that as they would in, in the, the wild. We just can't do it. It's not possible. In a spill, we typically are two feeding these birds seven to eight times a day which is, as you can imagine, a huge amount of work, people labor, and making the food and, and keeping it fresh, et cetera, um, and very stressful on the birds. But that's about the max. That's about the maximum number of times you can fill that bird's um, stomach and let it absorb it before you can feed it again. Um, during the daylight, you know, usually it's about 14 hour days. Um, you can't, you just physically cannot get more food in there than that. And that's, that's all they can handle. But that's not enough calories for them. So despite the fact that we're giving them all their food and all their calories, because we have to give them fluids as well as food, we can't do it. We can't do it as well as Mother Nature can. Not surprising, but, but it's very unfortunate. The other problem is we may be feeding these guys a lot of food, really pushing the calories hard. If they have gastrointestinal ulcers and bleeding, they're first of all, they're losing nutrients and they're losing blood through their GI tract. They're also not absorbing it very well because they have ulcers. So a lot, and we see this with some regularity um, when you're feeding an oiled or very debilitated bird. You feed it some food, fish slurry or some uh, commercial mix of food, and you know maybe an hour later the bird poops and it looks exactly like what you put in the other end. Okay, which is, you know is maybe less disgusting than you would expect, but it means that it went in 
and it just came out, right? Nothing happened. There was no digestion. There was no absorption. Um, we just essentially wasted that food. It went in and, and nothing happened. And so that happens a lot when birds, their body just shuts down. Again, these birds have an elevated metabolic rate. They're desperately trying to generate enough heat and um, don't think we haven't thought of that. Uh, <laughs> they have an elevated metabolic rate. They have very high um, energy needs and we just can't, we can't feed them. And if their body's not helping us by absorbing the nutrients, then we've got another, the cards are really stacked against us. If these birds have um, skin birds on their leg, their unfeathered areas, um, that, those will weep, they'll weep serum, and that's a high protein fluid. So we're giving them all this food, and they're just losing it all over the place. They're losing it through their skin, they're losing it through their GI tract, they're losing it in the blood, et cetera. So you can see that, um, Oiling is not just a matter of they've got some oil on their feathers, right? This is a huge multi-systemic um, metabolic problem. Another problem that is a little more subtle, not something we can see, but we know happens, is immunosuppression. So we all know about immunosuppression because humans are immunosuppressed from um, HIV infection, from other viruses, from chemotherapy. Well, these birds are immunosuppressed too, probably from a combination of not only the stress, but also direct effects um, on the immune system from the oil. And one of the important things that you, your body does to fight infection is make antibodies, right? And your antibodies are all made out of protein. These birds are often have very, very low protein because they're trying desperately to maintain their energy, to maintain their body condition, and they're just burning up protein like crazy. Um, and so if they don't have proteins to put over their keel, for example, or to put in their body, um, they're certainly not going to be diverting protein to strengthen their immune system, right? So when they're in this state of um, crisis, metabolic crisis, all of their protein, all of their nutrients, everything goes to, um, bless you, to uh, deal with the crisis and to get these birds to survive just moment to moment and they don't have the resources, the metabolic resources or the protein resources or the caloric resources to divert any of that into dealing with their immune system. The other problem is that even if these birds have a perfectly functioning immune system, they come onto a terrestrial environment, they come indoors, right? These are seabirds, they're not really into the whole concept of indoors. There's a whole suite of um, organisms, bacteria, fungi, um, viruses, etc., that these birds have never encountered, not only in their lives, but in their evolutionary histories. So these birds have no defenses against them. So it's kind of like um, when Europeans came to the Americas and all the Native Americans were killed from smallpox, right? It, these, it wasn't that the Native Americans were immunosuppressed or didn't have good immune systems, it was that their bodies had no um, history of dealing with this organism. Very similar thing with these seabirds. They are just being um, presented with a whole suite of things. Think of the dust, think of the um, other organisms and things that live in the air when we're indoors compared to outdoors. Big difference, and these birds are suddenly exposed to them when they're in a very stressed state. So uh, it's just a, a whole, you see a whole host of problems. Aspergillosis is a fungal infection. This um, organism is ubiquitous in the environment, indoors and out. We measured it in the air above pools, outdoor pools at our facility. Um, you can measure it in this room, I'm sure. You can measure it in potted plants. You can find it outside in soil, inside in dust. Um, it's a devastating disease. Typically, birds get um, disinfection in their lungs. This is a devastating infection for AIDS patients as well. So it's definitely something that we as immunocompetent people typically are dealing with every day, but our bodies manage to keep it in check because we have a healthy immune system. As soon as our immune systems are not functioning well, this is something that takes over. I think one reason that seabirds are especially susceptible, and I'm just speculating here, but it makes sense to me, seabirds are athletes. They're highly athletic animals. They're good at diving, they're good at flying, unless they're penguins. Um, they have a tremendously efficient respiratory system, right? They have to breathe in and die for minutes at a time. Very, very efficient respiratory system. So they're taking huge breaths. They're taking in a lot of air. Um, they have an extensive air sac system. So um, it makes sense that when they're going to have their system invaded, it's going to be through the respiratory system because they, they have such an efficient and um, they, take, they are exposed to so much air as they breathe. 
the heel and joint lesions, um, again, this is just a matter of how you spend your time, how your body is designed to function. Um, graves, what do they do all day? They, they fly, they dive, they swim. They don't walk, ever. And they're really never on a dry land. Same thing with loons. I mean, they're, even their nests are not really solid land. So a lot of those birds, um, their bodies have never been designed to, to bear the weight of their own body, even when they're skinny. And birds like alcids, like the murres and murrelets, um, puffins, those birds do stand on their feet and walk, but they mostly stand, they mostly perch, they don't walk a lot, and they don't bear weight for long periods of time on their feet. They're mostly flying for swimming. So their, um, their bodies are not designed for it. This is the keel of a bird, so if you look at a bird face on and, and uh, put your hand right on top of its chest, then you would feel a bone there. It's supposed to be covered with skin, but that's actually bone. That's not right. Same thing, this is the bird's what you think of as its ankle, I guess, or its knee. Uh, this is supposed to be just skin, and it's just a big, open, gaping wound. It's not bleeding because the weight of the bird has just um, degraded the tissue, and it's basically like a really severe bed sore in the person. These birds get these within days of being in captivity if they're not managed properly, and sometimes even if they are managed properly. This is a picture of a green foot. You can see what happens is they just get these open sores. They're, the reason these are bleeding is because we've um, kind of messed with them a little, opened them up a little bit, but these are just these raw, flattened areas. These rapidly develop into a bone infection, and once they're in the bone it's infected, they die of infection. So these are things that have nothing to do with oil, but they have everything to do with the fact that the bird is now in captivity again. Yeah. Um, when you make a determination that one of these birds or any animal has uh, irreparable damage, mm -hmm. their terminal, do you at that point make a decision to euthanize or do you let the course of the disease do it? Oh no, we euthanize them. It's a very hard, I mean, it's hard to make that decision because we've all seen, veterinarians have all seen cases that they didn't think would make it and they magically, right? But the vast majority of them don't, so where do you draw the line? Do you euthanize them earlier in the course or later? Do you wait to see what's going to be the miracle fix? We have those discussions a lot. The goal is to have those discussions early in the spill rather than later so that we say, all right, we're getting, we're expecting 400 birds in-house. This is the level that we're going to, you know, cut it off at. Basically, this is what we can handle. So, um, yeah, we do treat these birds as a group, not so much as individual cases when we have hundreds of them at a time. Um, but our goal is really, if they cannot be released, then to us we want to euthanize them sooner rather than later, rather than put them through the misery, pain, and stress of, of captivity. And most of these species do not do well in captivity at all, like in a zoo or in a train, they just don't do well. So it's not like if they, if we could get them to survive, but they wouldn't be strong enough to be in the wild, we could put them somewhere. Most of these animals would die in captivity anyway, so that's what we do. We do kill a lot of animals, but hopefully they die a gentler death than they would have left out in our environment. So just to give you a little glimpse of, of what we do in the wildlife response, our goals are, first of all, to normalize temperature and hydration. These birds are usually profoundly cold and profoundly dehydrated. We want to reduce additional exposure, which means we want them to stop preening. We know it's not going to do any good. It's using up their energy, and it's making them ingest oil. We want to improve their nutritional status because they've usually been out there for a couple of days and haven't had any nutrition. And we want to prevent all those horrible secondary effects like the keel lesions and the foot lesions from happening. One of the things we do right away is wherever the birds are, we make that room really, really warm because they're stimulated to preen when they're cold. So we want to try to get them to stop preening. Um, we also start giving them fluids right away. This is one reason why we just don't try to force whole fish into them all the time. We're trying to give them fluids first and then start to give them these um, food and fluid mixes so that they're getting fluids but they're also getting nutrition. We have a variety of wraps that we use to prevent secondary effects. This is like a little cross your heart bra for our green. It's called a, a keel cushion or a donut. Um, and basically it's a, a foam, a foam, like a swim noodle kind of foam, um, in a, a soft fabric that we put over the bird's chest and then wrap around its back 
I should have had, I should have a picture of a bird wearing one, but I personally don't. Um, and so that protects the keel, lifts the keel off the ground, so the, the cushion, the donut, is bearing the weight instead of the bird's skin. Uh, we cover their feet with booties. Um, we put them on net bottom pens, so they're they're suspended a little bit. It's not a hard, solid bottom. Also, that lets the feces drop through, so they're not if they do have any wounds or start to get a, a sore, it's not getting covered in feces right away. We try to keep the environment quiet, which is really hard and kind of impossible, but we do what we can. We cover them so they don't have as much visual stimulus. They don't want to be seen scary giant primates walking around all the time. But they don't like that. Um, try to make things as clean as possible. And for our, many of the birds that are highly susceptible to aspergillosis, we put them on an antifungal medication from the moment they walk in the door. Um, as a veterinarian, it probably would be more helpful if they started that medication two weeks before the spill, but I have yet to, to come up with a good way to get them to do that. <laughs> so um, this is a picture, it's not a great picture, of a green wearing a little donut. And again, this is a green, its head is over there, and there's its butt, and this is its chest going into the donut. I need better pictures of that, those aren't so pretty. But you can see here, this is the net bottom that we rest these birds on. So that was a quick whirlwind tour of um, what, what we do when we have the birds in house. You can see it's a lot of work, it's very stressful, it's very sad because we do end up organizing a lot of birds. Um, but um, overall, our success rate of the Lucian varies a lot by species, but is roughly 60%. So we do save more than we really would die. Um, I'll talk a little bit about the Lucian now and how it started. It was established in 1994 in response to Exxon Valdez. It's sort of state funded. There's um, interest on an oil company trust fund that is our budget, um, but then that money is transferred to the university, and it's part of the response arm of the Department of Fish and Wildlife and Prosper. Um, our mission is best achievable capture and care. So um, that's important. It's best achievable. It's not best ever. It's not um, good enough. It's the best we can achieve. We have um, 30 <coughs> member organizations. We equip, supply, and train them. And they are up and down the coast of California. And then these organizations provide facilities, personnel, volunteers during the spill. And they range from corporate entities like SeaWorld to nonprofits like uh, Monterey Bay Aquarium and um, Channel Islands Conservancy, if you get the um, full name of that. Um, as well as um, government entities, such as local and state governments, SPCAs, um, and universities. So University of California, Santa Cruz, um, obviously Davis, because that's where we're, we're housed. And this is a map of all of our organizations. The red, um, the red, Facilities are made, our main organizations, and then also these STAR facilities are what we call primary care facilities, where birds or mammals could be taken care of in an oil spill from from initial ent entry to release. So you can see we have pretty good geographic coverage, um, and we have very close associations with state, federal, and local governments. Um, very obviously, we work very closely with Oscar and. Um, although we're housed at um, UC Davis, we're still kind of a part of Oscar. The reason that we're housed with Davis is because I think in 1997, um, Oscar people, correct me if I'm wrong, I think it was 1997 where it was decided that they wanted OWCN to have a research component to investigate what the best achievable care practices were, and so that's why they thought it would be best housed at a veterinary school. So we have four R's that we talk about for what we do at OWCN, readiness, getting things, always being in a state of preparedness for a spill, response, research, and then reaching out education. So for readiness, we have multiple facilities. Most of these are multi-use, so they're used for either general rehab by other organizations or education when there isn't a spill, and then when there's a spill, those things get moved out and we move in. This is really helpful because it reduces startup time, it provides cost-effective maintenance, and it's providing really good, um, it's a really good resource for other either universities or nonprofits 
um, federal <coughs> governments. And some of them are used for rehab, some of them are used for education, classroom space, and some are used for research. We also have regular trainings. We have a yearly conference with lectures and hands-on labs. We have basic training series online that's available to all of our volunteers. Anyone who's a volunteer with a member organization has access to those trainings. And we do drills regularly. Some, um, some are bigger than others, but we do at least uh, one pretty big um, in-person drill a year. We do have um, provide some HAZWOPER training for, especially for field personnel who are going to be in the hot zone. Um, we have an online HAZWOPER refresher course. And we try to work closely with OSPRA to coordinate um, getting those field personnel 24-hour has longer trained. Um, we've responded to over 80 spills since our inception. Um, most of them have been in California, the vast majority of them have been in California, but we've had um, pretty significant presence in deep water and other non-California spills, as well as um, several international spills, like the Cole mentioned the Prestige in Spain, um, the Treasure Spill in South Africa, Rena Spill just a couple years ago in um, New Zealand. And we are um, recognized internationally to get a lot of um, queries from all over the world about our best practices. So the steps in a response, um, I'll go through those. How am I doing on time? Oh, okay. We're, we're okay. So we ha we have recovery and transport. That's where we start. Um, Osper is typically responsible for the reconnaissance part of looking for the wild where the wildlife might be. We then recover them, transport them, we process them, which means taking in evidence and give them an initial exam, stabilize them, clean them, condition them, and hopefully release them. Your box started maybe a little late, I guess, the first one we were transport. I'm interested as a unified commander and commander about activation and notification. Exactly. We'll talk about that okay, in right. a little bit. Um, this is kind of what happens after we're activated. We'll go back to that. So we, we need to collect field data, search effort logs, um, and not only that, but also hazing wildlife. So we do have a hazing unit that the goal is to get wildlife away from heavily wooded areas. This is obviously not useful if it's 24 miles of beach, but it's very useful if it's a small cove or a small, a small area that can be kind of uh, that can be discreet. Um, and that's really the ideal situation, right? The best wildlife response is to not let the wildlife get oil in the first place. Once a bird comes into um, comes into care, we have to collect all the legal information to make our case for NERDA and, and also um, any subsequent um, legal efforts. Um, so we need to log them in, we need to photograph every animal, collect a feather or some sort of oil sample. Again, we, those are archived and kept under lock and key so that if there are any issues with NERDA um, or with the spill in general, we can have that oil fingerprinted and shown to be the same oil that was spilled. And then every bird is banded. And we, we are hopefully moving in the future to not only banding them, but microchipping them, like you would for your dog or cat, so that they're permanently identified. And both live and dead animals are cataloged. We separate out into different teams so that um, the live birds are obviously going to be given priority because we want to keep them alive. But the dead birds are still counted, and we still get all the evidence we can from the dead birds. During intake, which often happens simultaneously with processing, um, we're examining the birds, looking at their medical health, in some cases deciding if the bird is too far gone already to go into rehab and we euthanize them. Um, but um, most of the birds are, are usually not euthanized ponds right at the beginning. We try to give them at least 24 hours. We collect a very small blood sample to get baseline where they're coming in. And our goal is to really have an exam that's about five minutes long and not longer, because we really want to limit the stress in the handling of those birds as much as possible. And then one thing that was learned somewhat in Valdez, but even before that, I think, is that although as a veterinarian, if I see a bird and it's entirely covered with oil, my first impulse is, oh my god, I have to get the oil off, right? You just want to wash it. And what um, we learned over the years um, is that if you take a bird that's covered in oil, they just walked in the door, and you put it in hot water and try to wash it, it dies. 
which is not very surprising. These birds are on the edge, right? They're right barely alive, on the edge of their metabolic ability to, to stay alive, and you just put them through tremendous stress by holding them down underwater. That's absolutely terrifying for a bird. So we can't watch them right away. So we have to do what we do, so we have to stabilize them. Um, which is temperature control, getting them warm, giving them fluids, getting them appropriate nutrition, and then we give them, we try to, to give them about 48 hours, and then after 48 hours, that's when we, the clock kind of starts. It's like, okay, this bird's been in, in care for, 20, for 48 hours, is it ready to be washed? And then every 40 to 24 to 48 hours after that point, we'll take a blood sample, we'll review its record, is it gaining weight, is it looking more or less uh, alert, um, is its blood work going in the right direction, et cetera. And then we have a set of wash criteria that I don't have up here, but it has to do with their blood work and their weight, et cetera. And if they meet wash criteria, we say, okay, this bird is slated for wash. And also over the last few decades, um, we know a lot about washing and what kind of water and procedures work best. We need water at about three to five grades of hardness. We want water at about 95 to 105 degrees, and it needs to be able to be maintained at that temperature, because these birds are already very cold. We use approximately 2% Dawn dishwashing solution, the blue Dawn, okay, green Dawn. People tell me the green Dawn doesn't work very well. I've never used green Dawn, so I can't tell you that for sure. Um, the reality of it is probably any dishwashing detergent would work fine. But people have done studies to show that, that a 2% Dawn is optimal. So if you're stuck somewhere in Burundi yeah. with a bird and all you have is joy, um, go for it, right? <laughs> but if you, you know, if you call Procter and Gamble, they'll probably be happy to send you some Dawn. Yeah. They don't need it all. But anyway, so that's what we use. We try to keep the washing period to under 45 minutes. Um, it's a challenge sometimes with a big bird like a pelican to really get the entire bird washed completely. You always want to um, have to wash the bird only once and not have to bring the bird back to wash, but sometimes that does happen as well. Rinsing, you need to have water, again, maintained at a temperature between 95 and 105 degrees at high pressure, appropriate hardness, three to five grains of hardness. Um, the rinse usually takes as long as the wash. What's amazing is as you're, washing, as you're rinsing a bird, the bird seems to get drier as you're washing it. It sounds crazy, but it's true because you're um, restoring their feather structure and they're able to now um, align their feathers a little bit and the water starts to bead up on their feathers. They won't be completely waterproof when you're done rinsing them by any means, but definitely as you're washing them, uh, the feathers start to look more normal and they start to look drier. When we dry them, we put them in those net bottom cages again because if you don't, they never get dry kind of on their ventrum, their front, um, if they're sitting on it. So we put them in a the dryer <coughs> pen and we put a dryer underneath them to blow air up. And that um, tends to be the quickest way to dry them. That can take also 30 to 40 minutes. And we use commercial grade pet dryers for that. Yep? That 2% <coughs> dog solution, <coughs> that's a lot. That's, that's two and a half ounces per gallon of dog. So, I mean, it isn't like when you're washing dishes. Um, I think my husband do that, so I <laughs> can't really compare, but it's kind of like, a, we, use it, we do tubs, so you put the water in and then you put the Dawn in, so it's a nice light blue color. Uh, you don't want it to be super sudsy, right? you just want it to be the liquid. Um, and we don't measure it out, typically. We typically just kind of pour it in so it's the right color, which is a light, a nice light blue color. Yeah, that's um, still quite a bit. Yeah, pe people it's have, surprising. yeah, people, especially, I think it's Tri-State in Delaware. I think they've done a lot of the experiments where they looked at the different um, percentages. Um, it depends on the product, too. For a very tarry one, you need more. For a lighter product, you need less. Uh, but it's, you know, they've, they've done the work, so. You probably stay away awesome. from the detergents that have contained bleach, right? We, yeah, except for the white birds, you know, that gets the bleach. Yeah, white bleach. That's the way to go. Yes, anyway, so um, once they're washed and dried, then they have to do most of the work for us. They have to get themselves waterproof. We can't do that for them. But we can help them along by giving them lots of opportunities to get in the water and come out of the water. And that seems to be what they need. And so they go out in the pool, and they're out there for 
an hour, maybe a couple of hours, and then we'll see they start to get waterlogged, they start to look like they're sinking a little bit. Then we pull them out, we dry them completely, and they go back in the pool, goes back and forth. And um, theoretically, if you just left them in a pool, maybe gave them a place to call out of the pool, they could probably do this themselves, but it would take a really long time. Whereas by completely drying them in between each time that they get wet, that seems to make a huge difference in how rapidly they regain their water moving. Conditioning, oh, sorry. Conditioning is, a, is difficult. There's not a lot of research done on this. It's a very challenging area to do research on, but we do try to pay attention to the bird's physical fitness um, as much as possible, so we don't worry too much if we have to chase them around the pool a bit to catch them, because we figure, all right, they're diving, they're moving around, that's probably good for them. Um, we like to see them as having as normal behavior as possible, so we keep a close eye on that to the best of our ability. We want their blood to come back. Um, and one thing um, that we've noticed is that as bird, once birds are washed, they seem to suddenly want to eat again. You know, some, some birds will eat when they're oiled, but most of them won't. And then you get the oil off them and they're like, oh yeah, I'm a bird. They kind of remember that they're a bird and they start acting much more normal. Um, pretty, pretty much immediately after they're washed. It doesn't always happen, but it does happen for a lot of birds, which is, is nice to see. Um, so you have to keep an eye out for those birds that are not regaining their normal behavior, that are still looking really droopy, that are interested in food, and those birds need to be separated out for individual attention to see if something else is going on or if they just need a little extra TLC. Before birds are released, they're always federally banded, so we can keep track of them. Hopefully, bands are returned. And um, our goal with OWCN is to get a lot of these birds to, um, fitted with telemetry devices so that we can evaluate how well we're doing as far as post-release, how well these birds are surviving out in the environment. Are they producing? Are they acting normally? Well? This is that's mainly for birds. What about the other like uh, marine mammals? It's the same kind of steps or very similar steps. Really, sea otters are the ones that are. Um, most relevant here. Pinnipeds, the, the sea lions and, and seals, and the dolphins. Um, cetaceans are, dolphins are really good at avoiding oil spills to begin with, um, and they're not covered with fur, so it's much less of an issue. Sea lions don't have fur except for fur seals, and even the fur seals rely on blubber much more than their fur to keep them warm. So they they don't get debilitated, so it's a lot harder to catch them, so we don't get as many in, in care. Oftentimes, um, Seals and sea lions come in for other reasons. They strand for other reasons, and they have a little bit of oil on them, have tar patches or something, but usually that's incidental. So we don't deal with them that much. Sea otters are the only marine mammal that don't have blubber, and they rely entirely on their fur to keep them warm. So they're basically like a bird. Um, so they need their fur, it has to be perfect, and when it's oiled, it's very bad. And they go through very similar steps. They come in, we try to get them as stable as possible. Um, it's a little challenging because sea otters are aggressive, so a lot of times we have to sedate them to handle them. Or if we don't, that means they're really, really sick. That's not a good thing either. Um, but same thing, we try to get them stable, maintaining their body temperature before we wash them. We wash them under anesthesia, again, because they're sea otters and they'll take your face off if they have a chance. Um, they're ferocious, very cute, very ferocious. Um, so they're washed under anesthesia, and that's a big difference compared to the birds. Um, but similar thing with, with getting their fur conditioned, they get in a pool where they can come out and try to encourage them to go in, in the water and out of the water, in the water, out of the water, back and forth. And same thing as far as getting them back on track. Um, and probably if, um, again, knock on something, we haven't had any sea otters oiled in spills in California, but if we did, um, probably all those birds, all those birds, all those animals would get um, telemetry units implanted and we would follow them very closely. So, you ever get repeat customers? Yes, yes, and oftentimes when we get repeat customers, that should prompt either, uh, hey, um, of the chain, of the ICS chain, hey guys, um, you told us this was a good area to release them, are you still confident in that? Did this bird just go back to its somewhere else and get oiled? Um, so it should prompt that question. It should also prompt the question, is this bird, is there something wrong with this bird other than the oiling? Was it sick to begin with and we just it happened to get oil and so that's why we ended up with it? Um, or did we miss something? Did we miss a secondary effect that occurred during captivity and we can see it on our release exam, et cetera? So we do get repeat customers and then we kind of go through a bunch of steps to, to deal with that. And if we get birds that come back like for the third time, usually those birds are just, you're just going to use them at them because they're not, there's something wrong. You may not be able to find out what it is, but there's something wrong and you can't fix them. 
They really like you. <laughs> we we always consider that, and we always end up ruling it out in the air. <laughs> no, that definitely couldn't be it. Um, so yeah, we, we don't like repeat customers. We like them to just leave. They don't even have to say thank you. So again, the reason that the um, OWCN was housed at the School of Veterinary Medicine at Davis was because of the research component. We really wanted to not just care for the wildlife that are affected by oil, but to learn how we can do it better. And that's really our goal. What are the effects of oil on wildlife? What are the effects on different species? How can we rehabilitate them better? How can we get um, better? What are the, the, uh, the markers for healthy animals? What, what can we do to, to send out the healthiest possible animals when we release them? How can we care for them most effectively and efficiently? Uh, and so we have a research program where we have a call for, for proposals and we fund people who want to do research. We also do in-house research. We've had three in-house post-release projects, um, MERS, Gulls, and REAPS. And we funded over 140 projects externally. Uh, right now, actually starting on Sunday, we're hoping to start uh, a study looking at um, the dispersant used in deep water the Corexit 9500, I think. Um, looking at the effects of that on feathers and MERS. So we'll be starting that this week, hopefully. Um, and uh, we have a variety of other research going on, looking at different biological markers, different treatments, et cetera. And then finally, reaching out is our fourth R. Um, that's a bit of a stretch for an R, but I think it works. Um, <laughs> We do have a fledgling K-12 education program. We have some information on our website for kids. As you can imagine, during a spill, we get tons of letters from kids, from classes, saying, how can we help? Sometimes they donate pieces of Dawn. Um, hopefully, it's the blue Dawn. If it's the green Dawn, we all just take it home for our dishes. But, um, <laughs> kids are always very interested and have a lot of compassion for wildlife, and we want to encourage that. That's great. So we're working on building more of a program for that. When I was um, when I started this job and was basically by myself in California while the rest of the team was in, I was sort of left behind to take care of California in case anything happened. If everyone else was in deep water, I kept getting these letters saying, what can I do? I want to help the sea turtles. I want to help the birds, etc." So kids really respond to this. They really want to learn about it and help. So we do outreach at local schools. We bring feathers and fake oil and have the kids wash feathers and little experiments like that so they can get some hands-on understanding of this and learn about you know, energy conservation, et cetera. We have pre-veterinary students and wildlife students come through our program and we have little we have um, half day or whole day workshops we'll do with them. We do a lot of veterinary trainings both for veterinary students and for um, graduate veterinarians that we do at, at conferences and things. Some public outreach, we have a website and a Facebook page. I think um, I think during deep water, there were something like 1,800 um, followers of our blog. So lots of um, lots of interest there. And we're also starting more and more to reach out nationally and internationally, not only to help during spills, but also to work on ways of having a united front for a wildlife response so that um, Different, so that the different, um, well, the different respons responsible parties can know what to expect with oil wildlife response to know what a good oil wildlife response would be. Um, so there's a lot of discussion right now. Mike Zaccardi, the director of OWCN, has been um, working very hard and, and very intensely with um, some people in Europe and also Brazil and South Africa trying to coordinate that. Um, so we're definitely becoming more of a global organization. So this is a question of how it works. The phone rings, or we get a, nowadays we get a text. Um, OSPR activates us. So OSPR is the organization that decides, OK, we're seeing some oil birds. There's a spill. You guys need to uh, gear up and get ready. We get the information that OSPR has, figure out what we need, and we just do it. We activate it. We send out emails to all of our member organizations, say this is what we need. These are the people we need. These are the um, facilities we need, etc. Um, um, and then we fill those ICS positions within the wildlife branch that Holly talked to you about. From our core staff, we have eight of us at Davis, and then from our member organizations. 
The other thing we have to do, which is not really our problem, it's the problem of whatever um, organization is in the facility at the time, all of the current rehab patients in the facility have to move out. So they start moving out to other facilities and we open up our facility just for this bill. Personnel is a mix of staff and volunteers, but most of our volunteers are pre-trained, which makes a huge, huge difference, as I'm sure you can imagine. Um, when Costco happened, you know, most of the volunteers in the wildlife facility were not the hundreds and hundreds of people who went running to fishing game and said, I want to help, I want to help. They were mostly the people that um, we had already trained, um, volunteers at our current member organizations. And we may hire some of those volunteers as well. And I think, again, um, Holly probably showed you this, but this is the wildlife branch and the recon group. It's not part of OWCM, but hazing, processing, care and processing, and recovery and transport are all part of us. Um, and then we have various units, which are actually now called strike teams. Sorry, Holly. Um, and we can split up into bird and mammal if necessary, and also split up into live and dead. Um, teams if necessary as well. Generally this is paid for by the responsible party so our, the budget that we get from OSPR is really for maintaining our state of readiness and keeping everyone trained and then when the spill happens that's paid for by the responsible party via the unified command um, and that's really a win-win situation because uh, the RP doesn't have to think about it. They're like okay you do it, you deal with it, you guys know what you're doing You'll give us good PR, and we don't have to deal with it. So generally, the RP is very, very happy to deal with us. It's also cheaper for them to deal with us, right? Because we have a facility, we have the people, we have all the stuff already in house. We can start right away. Um, it's very fast, so it's much easier and cheaper for them to, to do it than to do through us than to have them do it themselves. Oh, that was my last slide. Okay, any questions?